Ever wonder how the underwater world really thrives? What if I told you that the secret to a vibrant aquatic ecosystem lies in something you might overlook every single day? Get ready to dive deep with me into this AP environmental science experiment. We'll explore how aquatic plants snag and stash energy and how we measure that incredible process by calculating gross primary productivity or GPP and net primary productivity or NPP. It's a lot more exciting than it sounds, so stay tuned for some cool science. I'm Dr. Simon, and welcome to my lab. All right, so we're going to talk about both GPP and NPP, but for now, let's just focus on NPP. So what is it really? In plain English, NPP is the good stuff. You know, the stuff we all like. Food. Scientifically, it's the amount of energy that's stored in plants and actually available for hungry consumers out there. How do we get to NPP? Well, our plant heroes, the producers, are constantly performing photosynthesis, turning sunlight into chemical energy. And when they do this, it's like they're building a massive energy bank. That's GPP. But just like us, they need some of that energy to live, grow, and do their plant thing. That energy they use is called respiration. So you take the total energy they make, GPP, subtract what they use, respiration, and boom, you've got NPP, the energy surplus ready for the taking. And just as a quick refresher on that fundamental energy creating process, remember photosynthesis looks like this. You start with six carbon dioxides, you add six waters, you include a little sunlight, And that yields the product of glucose, C6H12O6, and some oxygen. That's photosynthesis. In contrast, respiration is the consumption of that stored chemical energy to produce ATP, an energy molecule used by the cell. And remember, the chemical equation for respiration is ultimately the backwards equation for photosynthesis. So start off with your glucose, C6H12O6. Then you need some oxygen, and that'll yield six CO2s plus six H2Os and a whole lot of ATP. Notice that both of these equations involve oxygen. In photosynthesis, oxygen is produced, while in respiration, oxygen is a reactant that gets used up. And because both of these processes are important for measuring NPP, we can actually track how much oxygen aquatic plants produce and use it to measure NPP. In contrast to NPP, GPP is simply the total amount of energy captured and harnessed by photosynthesis without taking respiration into account. Let's experiment. Here is what we'll need to complete this experiment. We need two clear bottles. These bottles need to be sealable. We're gonna be using 500 ml flasks with rubber stoppers. We need some pond water. I collected this pond water this morning by my house. We need some Elodia. Elodia is an aquatic plant that can live really well under sealed conditions. We need a dissolved oxygen meter. This measures the amount of oxygen in any liquid. And finally, we're gonna need something to mimic our two ecosystems. We'll need a grow light to provide conditions under light. And we'll use some foil to cover one of these flasks to mimic conditions of the dark. So let's get started. The first thing we're gonna do is measure the dissolved oxygen of our pond water. This will establish our baseline for what our water looks like. So you insert the DO meter into the water and you let it kind of even out until you get a nice flat reading. I'm getting a reading of 7.1 mgs per liter. So 7.1 is the amount of dissolved oxygen that we have in our baseline water. Next, we're gonna grab our flasks and we're gonna fill them 
with that pond water. So you wanna do this as carefully as possible, not to create a whole lot of bubbles. Because remember, bubbles will cause dissolved oxygen to increase in your flasks. So we'll do this for one of our conditions, and then we'll do it for our second. Now that we have our flasks filled with pond water, all we need to do is add our aquatic plants. To do this, you need to grab some equal amounts of Elodia and just insert them as carefully as you can into the flasks. And I'm gonna use a little poker I brought from home to push that in there. Again, you wanna be as careful as possible not to create air bubbles when adding your plant material. You also need to make sure that you're adding equal amount of plant material in each flask. So now that our Lodia are placed in the flasks, you just need to seal everything. It will make a little bit of a mess, but that's okay. And once sealed, then you need to put these flasks in their respective conditions. One of them will be put into the dark. This will prevent any light from reaching it. And to do that, we're gonna use our aluminum foil. Just simply place the flask in the middle of it and cover that up as much as possible. This will simulate our dark condition. And to have the perfect conditions to allow this Elodia to perform photosynthesis, we are gonna place it under a grow light. So now that we have our light set up, we're gonna allow these to incubate for about two to three days to allow the different processes to take hold and hopefully see a difference in our Elodia. See you guys soon. Okay, so it's been three days. And now it's time to look at these and measure the dissolved oxygen content. So the big thing to remember is that Elodia is a plant and it's made up of eukaryotic plant cells, which means that they're chloroplasts and mitochondria. So under the right conditions, they will perform both photosynthesis and respiration, which could change the amount of dissolved oxygen in each of these flasks. In contrast, the flask without any light would have just performed respiration. So under dark conditions, we can probably guess that the dissolved oxygen concentration decreased significantly while our light condition increased. But we just need to test that and figure it out. So let's start with observing both of these bottles. In our light condition one, we would expect to see a little bit of bubbles. And although it is very faint to see, along the stems, you can see little bubbles, which signifies that photosynthesis did occur. Another thing to look for is the overall health of our plants. Our plants look a little darker than how they began. They're not as vibrant but they're still pretty green, which signifies that they're still pretty healthy. And remember that while the right conditions were present, it was sealed without any additional oxygen coming into these plants. Now let's look at our dark conditions. So looking at both of these, they're pretty similar in appearance. I would say overall, this one just looks flatter. There's just not any bubbles that you can see that were generated, which makes sense because photosynthesis didn't happen. The only thing that was happening in our dark conditioned flask 
was respiration. But at the end of the day, looking at how these look is just one aspect of this experiment. To really figure out what happened and to measure NPP and GPP, we need to take the dissolved oxygen content of both. So let's start with our light flask. Wow, looking at the dissolved oxygen content, starting at around 7.1 was our baseline. We're now at 11.3 mg per liter. That's quite a large increase of dissolved oxygen, which totally makes sense because under the right condition, yes, both of these processes happened, but photosynthesis definitely created a lot more oxygen than respiration used up. Now in our dark condition, our dissolved oxygen reading is dropping quite a bit and it is stabilizing around 2.3 mg per liter, which is totally what we expected since our photosynthesis one had the right conditions to perform photosynthesis and therefore create oxygen, while our dark really just performed respiration and used all of the oxygen that was in our flask to begin with. While comparing these values is super cool, remember that the whole point of the experiment is to determine the GPP and NPP. But to do that, we have to use math. GPP is the total energy harnessed during photosynthesis, while NPP is the energy left over for consumers after producers use some of that energy for their own respiration. And so to calculate GPP, you will take your dissolved oxygen content from the light, which was 11.3 mg of O2 per liter of water. And then from that value, you will subtract the dark dissolved oxygen, which was 2.3 mg of O2 divided by liters. And then you will take all of that and divide it by the time elapse of our incubation, which for us was three days. So when doing this calculation, what you end up with is three milligrams of O2 per liter per day. And so that equals to our GPP that happened in our flasks. Now, GPP was not the only thing we wanted to calculate. We also wanted to calculate NPP. But to calculate NPP, what you need to do is first figure out the respiration rate. So to calculate the respiration, you take the initial dissolved oxygen, which was 7.1 mg of O2 per liter, and you subtract the dark. So that was 2.3 megs of O2 per liter. And again, you divide by the time elapsed, which is three days. So when doing this calculation, what you end up with is 1.6 megs of O2 per liter per day. So now comes the easy part, because we have these difficult calculations, we can easily figure NPP by taking the value for GPP, which was three, and subtracting from that value our respiration rate. And so when doing this math, what we end up with is an NPP of 1.4 milligrams of O2 per liter per day. So this value represents the amount of carbon produced and available for the next level of consumers in the ecosystem. That sadly brings us to the end of our fascinating journey into aquatic ecosystems. 
Throughout this experiment, we've witnessed the invisible dance of energy flowing through ecosystems and engaged in the very essence of scientific discovery. You've honed in on critical skills and observation, precise measurements, and doing calculations while also interpreting the data that tells us a story. This isn't just about dissolved oxygen levels. It's about understanding the interconnectedness of life on our planet. It's about appreciating the intricate balance that sustains us all. So I encourage you to keep that spirit of inquiry alive and look at the world around you with fresh eyes and never hesitate to ask why or how something works. Every question is a doorway to a new understanding. Lessons like these are what you'll encounter in your APES class. There's plenty more in our APES course too. Use as a companion to your class to prepare for quizzes and tests and get ahead of your peers for exam prep. Thank you for joining us today. If this video sparked your curiosity, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Your support helps us bring more science to life. Until our next experiment, stay curious and keep exploring.